I made a statement on, I think multiple YouTube channels that it is easier than any time in history to become a millionaire. And I've been doing some research and I have to say that I was wrong. Upward mobility, and this kind of feeds into the global reset, is extremely diminished in virtually every country in the globe. We have this big fancy tool called the internet and we have all of this information at our fingertips. However, social mobility is at an all time low. And I had to rethink that statement because what frame of mind was I in when I made that statement? And this is uh, something I'm guilty of. I'm looking at it from my life view. I'm not looking at it from your life view or her life view. I'm looking at it from my life view because after 23 years of being an entrepreneur, I have developed skill sets that make it very easy for me to make money. That's me. That's my journey. That's my development. And what I am seeing, because I, I was watching this YouTube video and it was talking about why it's harder to make more money than your parents. And I thought that was strange. But once again, I was looking at it from my life view because I am the hands down the most successful person in my family. Not only did I make more money than my parents, I make more money than anyone else in my family. And I did some research on that and I am a statistical anomaly. What I have done isn't normal, it isn't regular. And because once again, I live with myself, I see myself, I don't see this as something special. But I do remember years ago, I was on the plane and I was flying first class and I was next to this guy who was an entrepreneur. The guy was about 70 years old. And um, I, this was in the beginning of my, uh, I told him I wrote a book and I made $1.5 million. And dude slapped me, he said, that's fucking incredible. And that's what he said. And he was so shocked and as I told him my story, he was so, he was so in tune and he says, you understand how hard that is? He says, that is like Michael Jordan level hard. And you know, he was just going on and on and on. And I just kinda didn't really, you know, I was, you know, I was gracious, I, you know, we had a very really good conversation because he was an entrepreneur and we talked business, so it was a good conversation. But now I understand, because one of the things that, like I said, you know, um, there are many people here who will lead you to believe that you can get rich quite easily. And if you dive into the real statistics, the numbers don't bear that out. For me to make enough money in a month to buy a Porsche is not normal. It's not normal. And there are many people prostrating, prostrating on YouTube that you can make all of this money. But once again, let's have a conversation about the global reset. The global reset I've been talking about for three years. What I did understand and what I wasn't aware of is the global reset literally started when America abdicated being the manufacturer of the world. We abdicated that responsibility to China. And when all of those manufacturing jobs left the shores of America, that's when the global reset began. Because without, because with the manufacturing sector, uh, I will tell you the story of one of my uncles. He was able to leave Alabama, move to Detroit, go to work for Pontiac, make enough money to buy a house, get married and have a family and send all his kids to college. And this man didn't graduate high school. So when we got rid of that robust, and in the 1950s, Detroit was the world's second largest economy behind America. That's how much, that's how popping Detroit was. And when we got rid of those manufacturing jobs 
and we've moved to more of a service-based economy, a, a knowledge worker economy, so many people got left behind. Um, so many people got just, how can I say this? You don't know what you don't know. And when America shipped all our manufacturing to other shores, the people were just trying to make more money. They didn't understand, I don't think, if they fully grasped what they were doing that they would have did it. Because the removal of the manufacturing sector literally destroyed opportunity for hundreds of millions of Americans. Hundreds of millions. Because that pathway, it used to be in the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, you could go work at a company, right? You could literally start as a janitor and you can work your way up to VP. There was a girl that was talking about the guy she worked for and she said, this guy's the VP of this company and he can't read. I said, what do you mean? It's like, I have to read all of his emails to him because he can't read. So this guy was smart enough to climb the corporate ladder and he could not read. So that was the power of working in the manufacturing sector. There was so much opportunity. There was so much upward mobility. This is where a man without a college degree could go into the workforce and through the grit and determination of his work and effort, make some of himself and move up a few social classes. When we got rid of manufacturing, that disappeared. Um, I've been reading a lot of studies and even if you're smart, there's studies on this. Genius level IQ. They, they did a study of kids with 140 plus IQ. Genius level IQ. And they, there was a bunch of poor kids in this study, right? And there was a bunch of kids from well-to-do parents. Guess which group of kids did best in later on in life? It wasn't the poor kids. So even if you are smart, once again, I bring up the Example of Barack Obama and George W. Bush. From an intellectual standpoint, George W. Bush can't hold a candle to Barack Obama. He can't. But George W. Bush is several times wealthier than Barack Obama because of the family that he grew up in. So even if you're smart, if you don't have the cultural environment to groom you, to grow you, you could be a really smart kid and still grow up and be poor. I want you, I want to say that again. You could be a really smart kid and still grow up to be poor. And now we'll look at what happens in that environment. If you're a little smart kid in a well-to-do family, what happens? They get you tutoring. You grow up around other smart kids. You're in proximity of other smart kids from wealthy families. So that energy just grows and grows and grows. If you're a smart little kid in the hood, what happens is you start undertaking duties and responsibilities because you're so smart that there's no only reserved for adults, but you don't get the, the mentoring, you don't get the uh, uh, tutoring, you don't get any of that. Whereas these little kids who are already, you're, once again, from an IQ standpoint, you're both the same. But from a cultural and resource environment, you, as a poor little kid, grow up in an environment of lack and deficiency where this little kid who is rich grows up with amazing resources and ample opportunities. Like um, there was someone here on YouTube who started a company and he went to a neighbor, okay? And this neighbor gave him a million dollars. So this told me a whole bunch about this kid. Once again, this kid was living in a neighborhood a well-to-do neighborhood where his neighbors were millionaires. So he grew up in a resource rich environment. And that's why he was able to do the things he was able to do. Bill Gates grew up in a rich, rich resource rich environment. Uh, Steve Jobs grew up in a resource rich environment. Warren Buffett grew up in a resource rich environment. And you consistently see this from the wealthiest people. Um, Jeff Bezos' grandfather was the commissioner of the Atomic Commission. 
another resource rich environment. Jeff Bezos went to college and was working on Wall Street. He was doing a six figure job long before he even became the CEO of Amazon. So if you look at it, even from college athletes, if you look at the overwhelming majority of super successful college athletes, you know, you'll get some people like Derrick Henry who just through sheer raw talent, just make it. And Derrick, I think is one, of the, I think he's in the top three rushers in the NFL this year. And he's been there consistently because of his, his just sheer athletic talent. Derrick Henry transformed his environment because of that talent. And he, also you look at some other stuff. Derrick Henry has stayed out of trouble. Derrick Henry has not let his money get him into trouble, which is something that so many of these athletes do. But once again, if you look at um, Tua from the quarterback from Miami Dolphins, his mom and dad, they moved the whole family to Tuscaloosa for him. Another resource rich environment. You know, um, Chase Claypool, uh, the wide receiver for the Steelers, grew up in a resource rich environment. He grew up in the dual parent household. So you, you consistently look at who is transcending the social mobility and you go back and you look at who's growing up in a resource rich environment and who's growing up in a resource deficient environment. And you, you go ahead and you look like me, even though I did not grow up in a resource rich environment per se, I did have something that a lot of kids didn't have. I had a stay at home parent. And this is something that you will see with the little rich kids. They will have a stay at home parent. And you know, many, you know, many people say, well, a woman is just wasting away if she's a stay at home parent. I feel, and I'm gonna say this, if I ever get married again and we have kids, my wife will be staying at home. It's just that important. It's just that important because one of the things that happens is this kid gets a lot of attention, gets a lot of love during the formative years, which when you start to look at people who are socially not mobile, uh, I was talking to this girl who actually went to prison and she said something that was really profound. She said, when I was in prison, there's a bunch of people who just want to be the way that they are and they don't want to change. They don't want to grow. They consistently do the same thing. And this is something I said in my worthless people video. Um, so I have to stand corrected because if you're not connected, if you're not growing up in a resource rich environment, this isn't the easiest time in America for you to become rich from an intellectual standpoint, from knowing what's available and knowing the opportunities. It, it sounds good, but it's not true because when you look at the stats, you look at the numbers, upward mobility is at an all time low. The number of people who are transcending social classes is at an all time low. And I, can, I can't speak for any other country, but I know one of the reasons that this is happening in this America is that we got rid of the manufacturing base. We got rid of it because I remember as recent as when I was in high school, I graduated high school in 1985. I remember men, guys I went to high school with who would leave high school and go work in the coal mine. And within two years, they would have a house, a Cadillac and a wife. So this manufacturing um, economy was so robust that people could literally have a really good life, make money, enjoy life, take vacations, have a stay at home wife, buy a boat on one income. Now there's, there's some other reasons because taxes were not as high back then. That's another reason because a lot of your father's paycheck and your grandfather's paycheck didn't go to taxes. As speaking as someone who pays, I pay per month, I pay in two months what some people make in a year in taxes. So, you know, taxes can be ridiculous, but the upward mobility 
because this is something that I, I'll be talking about on my um, digital economy channel. Why was I able to be successful in the digital economy? Good communication skills. That's it. That's it. That's the beginning and end of it. And one of the things in my car rental business, I notice is people have demonstrably really bad communication skills. Really, really bad. And one of the things that I'm seeing, and I'm seeing a lot of uh, data points that talk about where people are that keep people in perpetual lower social economic status. Because like I said, I now looking at the data, looking at the stats, looking at the people, I don't believe for the average person that you can get rich. If you're an average person and let's define what is an average person. Let's say you had the benefit of growing up in a two parent household. And let's say you had the benefit of having a father who was present in your life, but your father, he was present in your life. He loved you. He groomed you. You have a good relationship with your mom and dad to this day, but they were poor. The social economic class that you're born in is the one that you typically die in. Unless some really huge force comes in to counteract that. And I feel what happened to me. I grew up poor but respectable. And what happened to me? I was going through marital difficulties. I ended up homeless. Being homeless was the catalyst for everything that I, that came after that. Because when you get to the point where you get so fed up that you are just going to start doing things differently. I reached that point where I couldn't stand myself. I was just sick and tired of being sick and tired. And at that point, that was the pivot, that was the catalyst for me to do something different. And I can go back and tell you exactly at what point things changed. I was in that boarding house for about 15 months. And one morning I was in the bathroom, I was shaving, and I, was looking, I looked in the mirror and I didn't, like, I didn't like the person looking back at me in the mirror. I, I did not like that guy. I was just like, you gotta change. I actually said, you gotta change. And that was, the, that was the pivot point. That was the catalyst to me finding Earl Nightingale, um, Brian Tracy, uh, Dr. Joseph E. Murray, and all these other transformative texts that taught me a different path. Uh, those were my, that was my, let's call it my university, call it my personal transformation university. And that is what started it because I figured some stuff out that a lot of people never figure out. I figured out like, this seems simple, but it's, it was a genius move. When I got laid off, I correctly assumed that they would check me out, but they wouldn't check out my reference. Let me say this again. I sat down and I came up with, I applied for five jobs that I knew I could do, but I didn't have a reference and I created my own reference. And at the moment, because this is one of the things I learned from Earl Nightingale, how to think, how to problem solve. So my problem was I lost a job, I need another job. So how can I get another job? I can put up a resume and once again, looking back, knowing what I know now, I was incredibly fortunate to get that job at rent crate You wanna know why? Typically in today's market, you cannot get those uh, jobs from cold response. Just sending your resume, you can't get that type of job today. You have to be walked in. You have to know someone. Someone in your network has to refer you. You can't get those kind of jobs today. So I was, I was incredibly fortunate at that time, a cold approach still worked. And that was the litmus test. That was the, the pivotal point for my personal transformation and for my social economic transformation, because from a, from a statistical standpoint, 
I should be married to a woman in Alabama and we should have three kids and we should be eating meatloaf, collard greens and mashed potatoes on Sunday and going to church and I should be about 400, 500 pounds. From a statistical sample of the way that I grew up, the environment that I grew up, and I have to ask myself, why did I get out? I got out of my environment. I don't know what pushed me out of my environment, I have to think about that, but I got out the environment and going into the military was one of the best things I ever did because that was a good decision that removed me from that environment and it created great exposure for me, created a lot of exposure. So one of the things that I've looked back upon is education. And this is something that many people do not want to do. I jumped, I dropped out of college my junior year. So I have a few years of college. But if I look back with getting in the storage auction business, you know, education, from getting that first job at Rent a Crate, I bought books on how to cold call. So from that point on, 23 years ago, I have been in a point of self education for 23 years. So even though I don't have a college degree, I feel that my education has been top notch because look at the results. My education has led me to creating a business that makes enough money to buy a six figure car in a month. That's, those are, that's proof positive of my education. And this is the thing, my education isn't over. I never actually took that present like, you know, I graduated, I'm there, I'm, I'm, I've been in a constant state of education. And if you look at people in the higher social economic levels, education is an ongoing concern. And you look at people in the lower social economic strata, education stops at high school. You've got people who are walking around here who've not read a book since their last book report. And if you look at their lives, if you look at how they're living, because like again, I'm gonna say this again. Once I made that statement that it is easier in this time in history to become a millionaire, I was looking at me. I wasn't looking at the great masses because once again, to become rich is a behavior-based activity. And if you look at the behavior, like, you know, I put up that video consistently, and this has become a part of, of, of deep study, and it's, it's highly interesting to me, that I get these people who leave these uh, dissenting remarks, and I go to block them, I consistently see the low information diet, I consistently see that these folks are eating mental junk food and they've not accomplished anything. Like this one person who left, I didn't even read it. Uh, it was like a three paragraph long comment. I just went and blocked him and deleted it. And he was watching anime, he was watching some other stuff and all he was following prank channels. So his whole information diet was nothing but junk food. There was nothing intellectual, there was nothing. And I was just sitting there like, and this, this is something else too. In the world today, in the social media world, everyone craves attention. And I, these people are from the lower economic strata and they want my attention. I'm like, literally people are like, they wanna have conversations with me. It is, it is funny. I'm like, why would I even talk to you? You are a nobody. You're not gonna help me. You're not on my level. Why would I even talk to you? And it's, it's, it's gotten to be humorous. It's, it's kind of funny because uh, typically I get one to three a day, or I may get someone who may get froggy and leave something on each channel, which is so cute, which is so cute. And why are they doing this? Because uh, actually I did some research on this. And the reason that people leave insulting remarks is because they have an inferiority complex which feeds right into what I'm saying with the worthless people. 
Because I was like, because I went ahead and I did some research. It's like, why would someone insult someone they don't know that's done nothing to them? And there's a whole field of study about this because behaviors and stuff. And once again, there's a certain level of, there's a certain class of behaviors that are exhibited by people on the lower economic strata. Um, you know, this whole thing of calling someone out. Um, people on the lower economic strata put emotion and feelings ahead of everything. And people on the higher economic strata put facts and logic before everything. A lot of these people on the higher economic strata don't even believe in God. They're like, there's not enough facts and evidence to even prove to me there's a God. So I don't believe in God. Yet people on the lower economic strata invariably all believe in God. Because once the thing, having a God, and I'm like I said, I believe in God, but I believe in God in a different manner than most people, um, removes responsibility. So when you're on the higher economic strata and you don't believe in God, then you're like, everything in my life is under my control, is my responsibility. You get a different set of results. But if this is like, well, God wants me to be here, it removes responsibility. And this is why people like, once again, like one of the problems I have, a persistent problem, I got this problem, like literally I've had three rims destroyed and you know, one rim they were able to send out and get it reshaped and put it back on the vehicle. And then another rim, a chunk of the rim is missing. And another rim has three cracks. So I am seeing, and once again, the guy who cracked the rim on the Mercedes, he lived in the hotel. The correlation between being poor, unorganized, filthy, and destructive is super strong, super strong. Like where I'm at now, like I've walked down the hall and some people left their doors, doors open. And this is an upscale community. Everyone has a neat place. It's clean, it's orderly, once again, Filthy, unorganized, low impulse control. You be, you're destructive. You're just destructive. So once again, like I said, now I'm, I'm being repetitive for a reason. I no longer believe that right now it is the easiest time in history for people to become wealthy. And for the following reasons. Number one, to become wealthy, you have to take action. And most people are not action takers. Number two, you have to be consistent. Most people are not consistent. And number three, you have to deal with setbacks very well. Most people cannot deal with setbacks. So just those three attributes alone knock out the majority of people from becoming wealthy. And one of the things that I'm consistently seeing, like I got on the global reset about three years ago. And what I didn't understand without further analysis and study that the global reset literally started in the 1970s. That's when it really started. And we've been having people shifting down, shifting down, shifting down. Now this is what's really ironic about this. Right now on an educational level, we have more Americans with college degrees than we've ever had before. Yet many of these people, and this is something that I used to do when I go to a restaurant, I would talk to the barista or the bartender and invariably they all had a degree, but they were doing jobs that didn't require a degree because one thing, and this is something I'm going to do a whole segment on is why do people feel that getting a degree is going to liberate them from their social economic class? I'm going to do a whole segment on that because one of the things that I'm consistently seeing is across, like when I meet someone, I can pretty much peg where they are based upon their communication skills. And this is something that's backed up by Brian Tracy did this thing. He was talking about vocabulary. The bigger your vocabulary, the more people you can, um, actually he said, the bigger your vocabulary was, the more money that you made. And if you will talk to people in the lower economic strata, 
you will see over and over very poor vocabulary skills. We will see over and over uh, a fundamental disrespect for the English language. And you will see the adaptation of behaviors that will keep them poor and an absolute rejection of behaviors and attributes that would make them wealthy. And these are conscious decisions. These are, con these are not things like, you know, you just made it from an alphabetical, alphabetical uh, standpoint. No, no, no. These are conscious decisions that I am not going to improve myself. I'm cool the way I am. I don't need to educate myself. No, I don't need to do that. And you're just seeing, like once again, right now we have the largest college educated population base that we've ever had. Yet many of these folks are caught up in the global reset because they have degrees. I'm, let's call them junk food degrees. They have a degree, but it's a junk food degree. You, you could pay 30,000 for this degree. You could pay 300,000 for this degree, but this degree is not going to get you a job that can satisfy the student loan debt. So we have a lot of people with junk food, junk food college degrees. And you know, as I'm looking at this, cause you know, I'm getting ready for pure, pure money, the digital economy channel. Cause uh, I, I feel I put up a really good video talking about the process of writing my first book and not leaving out details. Cause this is the thing that a lot of YouTubers do. They leave out the, the per important details and like, you know, how was I able to devote months to working on my YouTube channel and not make money? Cause I had money in the bank and I had a nice little side hustle that didn't require me to work 160 hours a month. And you know, so check that out. Uh, I need to link the pure, money channel to all of my channels. I need to set all that up. But once again, man, economic downward mobility or the lack of economic upward mobility is at an all time high. It is an all time high. So to put that in proper perspective, your grandfather who worked at, let's say Ford, your grandfather who worked at Ford, who dropped out of school in the 10th grade, had more economic mobility than you do, and you have a college degree. Because so many things have changed. So many things have changed. Our society has changed, our mores have changed, and it has put us in a very strange place because if you're educated, if you're connected, if you have the right environment, Yes, it's easier than ever to get rich, but you need to be educated. You need to be connected and you need to be in the right environment. And these are three attributes that I never even gave consideration because when I made that statement that it is the easiest time in history to become rich, if you're positioned in that proximity, yeah. But if you don't have any positioning in that proximity, um, no, it's a, you know, as Randy used to say on uh, American Idol, it's a no dog, it's a no. You're not going to get rich anytime soon, ever, ever, because of the fundamental way that you were groomed. And, you know, like, like I said, uh, there, there's a, a woman in this building and I have a nickname for her. I call her Mrs. Cosby because she's, she's, she's Claire Huxtable to me. She has that look. She's extremely well-spoken, very nice lady. And I can tell that she grew up in a family with money. And I don't even know this chick, but I can just tell she's from North Carolina. I can just tell. And one of the things that I consistently see is that just the way people dress, the way they speak, you can figure out what socioeconomic class they're in. And another thing that is happening, and that let's call it the new money hustle. You'll have someone who may become a rapper or a social media star and they'll make the same kind of money as someone over here on the higher social economic level, but they don't have the grooming, they don't have the breeding, they don't have the behavior. They're just a poor person with a poor person mentality, but they have money. And that's something else I see quite a bit of. 
So it's going to be interesting because we're going to have more little chats like this and more talks about this here at the Institute of Economic Thought. But no, this is not the easiest time in history for you to become rich if you're an average person. You don't have the environment. You didn't have the resources. You don't have the connections. You, there, there's other little things that go into it because uh, what happened to me was I worked in the storage auction business. In the storage auction business, I had a very high income, but I wasn't wealthy. I was wealthy in no stretch of the imagination. But that gave me the education to come to YouTube and I'm just keeping a buck. I had no competition. I actually was operating in an environment for four years with no competition, none whatsoever. And that right there alone, uh, people started writing storage auction books once, because you know, if you know anything about marketing, first thing you want to understand about your market is your market growing or is your market dying? And that market didn't exist. That market went up real quick, then it died real quick. And a lot of people got into the storage auction book business as the market was dying. <laughs> Where I was in it when it was, I was in it on the way up and I exited on the way out. So that is the thing that made me wealthy, that my first digital product is what gave me the exposure. It opened up the doors. And more importantly, it gave me something that a lot of poor people don't have. It gave me capital. It gave me capital. And this is a big, big thing because we'll be talking about this on personal property because I know like I sound like the, you know, the anti whatever man, but there's so many YouTube videos that will give you the preposition that if you have the right mindset that you can get rich, you can be invest, you know, on the successful investors. And it's simply not true because the math and math, men lie, women lie, math doesn't lie. And the math says, no, the math has determined that that is not going to work. And you know, it, it's just funny, but I'm going to get a little bit more introspective and then we're going to talk about some more of these things because I feel that this is important because if you have the right information and you make the right moves and you position yourself in the right environment and you do the right things, and you exhibit the right behavior. Yes, you can get rich. But just as an average, regular person that growing up in America, mm -mm, it, ain't, it ain't possible. It ain't possible. You have too many things against you. Just too many things against you. So that's all I got for you guys. Hopefully you enjoyed this. Let me know what you think in the comments and I will see you in the next one.